In our third and final video on advanced debugging in Sigline, we're going to be looking at how we can debug processes that are already running, or on other machines, as well as where root privileges are required, and how to open core dumps and look around them in Sigline. But before we get to those, let's take a closer look at the debuggers running under all that, GDB and LLDB. Now LLDB was designed as a drop-in replacement for GDB, although they do do some things a little differently. Now we usually bundle versions of both on most platforms, so you can choose which you prefer. You can also provide alternate builds within certain ranges that are documented under debugger options. Now most of the features we've looked at so far are built on top of what GDB or LLDB offer. But if you're already familiar with the underlying debugger, you'll be pleased to know you can still use it directly in the GDB or LLDB tool window, but with the benefit of CLINE's completions. As I'm using the bundled LLDB here, I see an LLDB tool window. But if I was using GDB, I'd see the corresponding window for that. Core functionality is the same regardless, and either way, you've got complete access to it here. Because we are talking directly to GDB or LLDB here, it's a good place to experiment with what can be resolved in an expression. For example, for me right now, I can call the data member on the strings but if I try CSTRA, it doesn't resolve. And that's just because the symbols are not available. Now, if you are familiar with GDB commands, you might want to have some commands that run every time you start debugging. You can put these commands in the .gdb init or .lldb init files. A common example would be adding custom pretty printers. So if you put these files in your user home directory, they will run when you start debugging any project. For the pretty printers, that's probably what you want usually. But if you just want commands to run for a specific project, you can put them in the project route. Do note though, that by default, these project specific init files are ignored. But you will see this warning message that, helpfully, tells you what you need to do which is to enable project root init files by setting this property to true, which you need to do in your home directory init file like this. Now here we've got a small demo that uses some POSIX calls to get the name of the owner, the running process and print it out. If I run that normally, I'll see my username printed out. From the terminal, I can run with sudo and see that it recognizes the owner as root, but the detection for our enum seems to be going wrong. So how can I debug it? Well, in the run debug config, we now have a new option to run with root privileges. If we check that and start to debug, we'll see that we're asked to authorize as root. If we do that, Start stepping through. We come to this line here, where it goes the wrong way. It seems that we're matching against the wrong string. So let's change that and try again. Great, now that seems to work. There's a bit more to say about this elevation feature though. First, if you're using a recent Apple Mac, you may have other options. If you have Touch ID, you can authorize with that or if you have an Apple Watch on the same iCloud account, you'll be given the option to authorize there. Even so, it can be tedious to authorize on every run if you're doing it a lot. So we've added a separate elevation service, which you can configure in the settings under Appearance and Behavior, System Settings, Process Elevation. That will stay running for 15 minutes or whatever you set here with the elevated privileges and we'll launch the debugger in that context. That time limit can optionally be extended every time you run, so you'll really have to reauthorize in a single debug session. All of the examples that we've looked at so far have involved starting your executable in the debugger. But what if you want to debug a process that's already running, perhaps because it's stuck in a loop or something? 
As an example, if I run this executable from the command line, here using the built-in terminal, we'll see that after a while it just gets stuck. So what's going on? Well, from C line, we can attach to process. We're presented with all of the processes on the system, which is likely to be quite a lot. So fortunately, we can quickly filter that down just by typing. So we're now attached to the process, but of course we don't have any breakpoints set. That's sort of the point. We don't know where the problem is. So what we can do is we can pause execution. And that just breaks wherever it happens to be at the time. So here we're being shown a line in our code, but sometimes we'll see from the stack frames that execution is actually a bit deeper in than that. And if so, we can look up the stack. We'll just get the disassembly view, but we'll usually start in our own code anyway, as that's where the bug is likely to be. Anyway, here we can see that we're in this loop. It's counting backwards while we're more than or equal to zero, but we can see from our handy inline hints that we're way above our initial value. And that's because this is an unsigned type. So we're never gonna be less than zero. This is our infinite loop. So we probably wanted a signed loop variable here, or maybe just use greater than. So let's try that. And if we switch back to the terminal, we'll see that our process is actually still running. When we stop debugging a process we attach to, it detaches the debugger rather than stopping it. So we're gonna to need to stop it here. And now we can run our new version. And now it runs to completion. We fixed the bug. We can actually attach to processes running on other machines too. Although for that, we need the help of GDB server. Let's see how this works debugging from this Mac here to an Ubuntu VM. Now there's a few ways to do this and we won't cover them all here. But in this case, we'll be building the remote executable on the remote machine which here is this VM. Now we've already got the source files here, in this case cloned from Git, and built an executable with debug info. It's the same little console app but with the infinite loop from the previous demo. To debug this remotely, we're going to need the IP address of this machine. So let's grab that now. Now over on the local machine in C line, we can add a new run debug config. The one we want here is GDB remote debug. To do it this way, don't select remote GDB server, which is something slightly different, and we're gonna come back to that in just a moment. Now we'll give it a name. We need a version of GDB that has multi-arc support, and we have one bundled, so usually we'll just accept that default. For target remote arcs, we need that IP address we copied earlier. And we'll add a port number. I'm using 8080 here, but actually a different number might be better. Either way, we'll use it again soon. We also need to provide a symbol file. Now we've built that remote executable with debug symbols, so that's the file that we need. So I'm gonna copy it from the VM to my local directory. Because this is a VM, I can just do a normal copy here, but otherwise we could use something like SCP. And now I can open that back in C-Line. We also need path mappings. This is so C-Line can match the source lines in the local files with the symbols built against the remote machine. So we need the source route from the remote machine, which I got with PWD. And then the source route on the local machine. Now, since it's the same code base we looked at earlier, I've already got it here, but you may need to copy files or, or clone it from a VCS repo. And that should be it. If you do get warnings at this stage, check that all your paths are correct and the right way round. And now we're ready, but we'll need to start the executable with GDB server on the remote machine. We'll need to give it that port number that we specified earlier in the run config. And of course, the name of the executable. And it's now waiting for a connection before it starts to debug. So let's start debugging in C-Line. We connected and our app is running. Now we can set breakpoints or as we did previously, just pause the debugger here see where we are in the code. And we even see our inline variables, just as if we were local. And the stack frames, of course. In fact, most of the local debugger features are fully available here as well. Now we did cheat a bit by running the app from GDB server to start with. But we could also attach GDB server to an already running process, and then connect CLine to that in just the same way. So we'll need to get the process ID, which I'm getting here using pgrep, and then run GDB server, 
here with sudo, although there is a way to avoid needing that, and use the attach option here with that process ID. And there we go. Now this was a useful workflow if you already have an app built and running on a remote machine. But if you want to cross compile the app locally and then have it synced across, that's where the remote GDB server config is a better fit. We also support for remote development over SSH is yet another option. This can also be used, for example, in Docker containers as well. And finally, if you're on Windows, we support building and running in WSL and WSL2 using a similar but more specialized technique. For more depth on all of those options, do see the remote development webinar video. Now we all know C++ gives us plenty of opportunities to introduce non-deterministic bugs, and they can be really hard to fully root out in a controlled environment. But if you have core dumps enabled, which on macOS you can do by running limit or unlimited, then when a crash like this occurs, a core dump file will be written out. Again on Macs, this will usually be written to slash cores. Now CLine can open these core files and let you do snapshot debugging. If symbols are stored in a separate file, you can provide that here as well. Otherwise, that's all we need. And now we can see the line that calls default, look around at variables, and move up and down the stack. But the process isn't running. It's all coming from the core file. So of course, we can't step through the code, but this can be an incredibly useful way to debug hard to reproduce bugs, or crashes that only occur on certain machines. So that's it. We dug into most corners of CLine's extensive debugging features, although we're always adding more, so do keep an eye out. In this video, we looked at accessing the GDB or LLDB terminal, using GDB init or LLDB init, and then beyond the current process, attaching to local and remote processes, as well as core dumps and how to run the debugger with root privileges. If you haven't seen the first two parts of this series, do go back and watch those too. But in any case, Thanks for watching and happy debugging.